All right, I'm going to spend the next couple of weeks talking about uh, the church. And, you know, I thought that it was a pretty basic subject, but I think as you start to sort of flesh it out and address all the things to do with church, it's actually going to turn into like a series. So I'm going to preach over the next couple of weeks. And, and often, like we were saying last week, or was it la- the week before, Kevin preached last week, you know, often um, basic doctrines are very simple, but it's usually the misconceptions and the false doctrine that is out there and a lot of the things that people add to uh, the truth that make it uh, more complicated than it needs to be. But I want to talk specifically today about um, the church and comparing the church to the body of Christ Um, because they are actually two different things uh, even though they're related. Uh, So, you know, what what is the body of Christ? So we read in um, Romans 12, and I'll show you a couple of verses, but the body of Christ is every believer. Every believer, everybody that's saved and born again makes up uh, the body of Christ. And we see here in Romans uh, 12, 4 and 5, for as we have many members in one body, so it's saying many basically parts, many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many, are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another. Uh, Let's see this as well in 1 Corinthians 12. Oops. 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And then it goes on to say that God has put authority in the church and the different offices that can be there. Uh, Let's look as well in Ephesians 5, verse 30. Um, Let's look look here. That he might, and we see here the link here between the church and the body as well. For he might, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Um, so we see there that you know the members, or the, the church, which are the people, uh, are the body of Christ. So how do, does one uh, join the body of Christ? So well, let's have a look at a couple of verses there. Um, 1 Corinthians, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 12. And when we were there just before. So we see, we've seen that every believer uh, makes up the body of Christ. We see also that the church is referred to as the body of Christ. Um, Now, how does somebody join the body of Christ? Well, you join the body of Christ when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are baptized with the Holy Ghost. So you remember when we talked about the topic of baptism, there's the baptism with water that represents the baptism of the Holy Ghost and that's why we're baptized by immersion. But the baptism of the Holy Ghost is actually what adds us to the body of Christ. And we see here, we already read uh, in this chapter, but it says here in verse 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have, made, uh, and have been all made to drink into that one Spirit. Now I want you to just note there, because we're going to uh, read this a bit later on, but just note there that you know, we're baptized into one body by the Holy Ghost, by the Spirit, uh, so there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither bond or free, and have being all made to drink into one spirit. So the drinking of the spirit there. Uh, Just uh, note that in the back of your mind. Romans 6, we'll see the same concept here. Know ye not, verse 3, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So I believe there that that baptism is talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost being baptized into Christ. Uh, We see also in Galatians 3.27, 
that same phrase again. But as many of you as has, have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we saw that similar thought there in 1 Corinthians 12 where it said there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Um, there is neither Jew nor Greek here. All right, so that's what the body of Christ is. The body of Christ is every believer. You join the body of Christ by getting saved. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You are baptized by the Holy Ghost into the body of Christ, into Jesus Christ. And the last point I just want to make about the body of Christ, uh, we'll go to Ephesians. Ephesians 2 verse 11. The last point I just want to make about the body of Christ is I believe that there is only one body. So there's only one, I guess in a sense, universal body. I know we stray away from that word because of the, the universal church doctrine. But there is one universal body. Every believer is part of this one body. There are not multiple bodies. I just want to show you this in Ephesians 2. Uh, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So just notice here that there's the comparison between Gentiles, which are basically any nation besides Israel, and then you have the, the Jews, which are the nation of Israel. Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, so there's the Gentiles, by that which is called the circumcision, that's what, what is a, a Jew, in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So aliens there being, meaning that you're not a citizen of a nation. You're an alien, not an extraterrestrial. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one. So these, these nations, the gent. Jews and, and every other nation, which are the Gentiles, so this includes everybody, right? For he is, he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So because of the blood of Christ, that wall that divided Jew and Gentile is now abolished and we are made one. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, there's the two, one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, there's that one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So, you know, I believe that supports the fact that there is one body, the fact that every nation, um, Christ has broken down that middle wall of petition and made us all one body. And if that's not clear enough, if we just go down further to chapter 4, it says here, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Here we go. There is one body and one Spirit even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you, in, in you all. Now, I think some people may, may resist this you know, one body doctrine, the, the fact that every believer is one body, because we do not believe in a universal church. You know, I don't believe in a universal church, and I'll get onto that in a moment when I talk about the church. But I think it's very clear in the Bible that there is one body that everyone is a part of. Not only in Ephesians 2, where it's saying every nation has now come, become one nation through the blood of Christ, but also here it says there is one body. And, and somebody might say, well, you know, this is just talking about the local church, like we're one body, but another church is another body. But that doesn't fit the context of what's being said here because it says there is one body and then it says there is one spirit. And then it, then it goes on to say there's one Lord and one faith and one baptism, which I believe is talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and then the baptism with water is just representing that one baptism and one God of Father of all. So there aren't multiple spirits, multiple independent spirits. There aren't multiple independent you know, um, you know, lords and faiths and baptism. 
there is one of these, and that's why I think this verse is very clear that there is one body of Jesus Christ. So that's the body of Christ. But what, uh, what is the church? Well, let's uh, see first of all what the word church actually means. So if we go to Psalms 22, 22. The Bible says here, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So we see this Old Testament psalm says congregation. This psalm is actually quoted in Hebrews 2.12. And look at how it's quoted. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. So we don't really need to go to a dictionary to find the meaning of the word church. There's nothing wrong with a dictionary. There's a place for dictionaries. But oftentimes the Bible can define its own words and we can use the Bible as its own dictionary because we see here an Old Testament passage requoted in the New Testament and we see that at the word congregation, which we saw there in Psalms 22.22, 22, in the midst of the congregation, is requoted in the New Testament in Hebrews 2.12 uh, saying in the midst of the church. So we see there that the word church is defined as a congregation. And what is a congregation? A congregation is a physical gathering together of, uh, of people. You wouldn't, call a you wouldn't call a congregation of people when they're, when they're all scattered all over the place, would you? You'd say that they're a congregation when they physically gather together. And that's what a church is. And you know, when the, when the Bible uses the word church in regards to you know, a gathering of God's people, it is referring to you know, the, the church of God, the church of Christ. Because even though the word church can just mean any gathering, you know, when you read through the Bible, even though it just uses the word church, it would refer to, obviously, the church of God or the church of Christ. Uh, let's just go to Matthew uh, 16, verse 13. Uh, this is the first pas passage in the Bible where the uh, word church is even used. Uh, let's read from verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some say, Some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they shall tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So this is the first mention of the word uh, church in the Bible. It's in Matthew uh, 16. And we just want to note there that it says, uh, Jesus said, But thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So there is a distinction between the church that Jesus Christ is building, the church of Christ or the church of God as it's mentioned in the Bible, and just any church, just any gathering of people. Because you have, for example, the church of Satan. You know, they're not a legitimate church. They call themselves a church. And, you know, they are a gathering of Satan's believers. Or you have, for example, the Church of Scientology. So they use this word church because, you know, it's not wrong for them to call it church because the word church just means a gathering of people. But we need to note that in the Bible, you know, obviously we're talking about God's church, the church that Jesus Christ is building, uh, the church of believers, because we obviously have false churches out there. Um, now, I just want to just mention a couple of things in this passage because, you know, a lot of people use this passage to sort of promote that, you know, Peter was the first pope. And they try and say that Jesus is saying here that, you know, uh, in verse um, 18, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And they'll say, see, there you go. Peter was the first pope, and this is the rock that Jesus was going to build the church on, on Peter. And it says here, you see, and, and Peter, it says, I will give thee the keys of the kingdom. 
So there's a singular there that, that Peter was given this privileged position. He was given the keys of the kingdom and whatsoever he bound on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever he singular loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Well, well, number one, you know, we can't take this passage and just run with a doctrine um, and, and isolate it on its own because when we read all throughout the Bible, the rock is always Jesus Christ. So another way that you can interpret this passage is you could say, well, it wasn't Peter was the rock that he was referring to, but the fact that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God, and he's building his church on that rock, on that principle and on that doctrine. And when we see throughout all the Bible, I'm not going to turn to all the passages, I'll just turn to a couple, that it's very obvious that the rock that the church is getting built on is not Peter the man, but it's on Jesus Christ himself. Look at this verse in uh, Psalms uh, 18.31. It says here, for who is a God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? So God is that rock that we build our lives on. And uh, I just want to show you in Matthew 7, 24. When uh, Jesus gives the parable of the wise man and the foolish man, the wise man building his house upon a rock and the foolish man building his house upon the sand and the rock being the Word of God, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Word of God, uh, and the Son of God is the Word of God made flesh. Verse 24 says here, Therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. Now think about it. If you're a wise man when you build your house upon the rock, the church is referred to the house of God, you know, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of ground of the truth, why would then Jesus build his house on any other rock? You know, Jesus obviously is a wise man. He's going to build his house upon the rock. He's going to build his house on the word of God. He's going to build his house on the Christ, the son of the living God. So we don't want to uh, misinterpret this verse here in Matthew 16. But you might say, well, but look, Peter, it says here, the, it's a singular, he was given the keys and not anybody else. So, so doesn't that sort of fall into the narrative that Peter was given this privileged position? Peter's what's going to be uh, the church is going to be built on. Peter is given the keys of the kingdom. Well, let's look in uh, Matthew 18. We just want to compare it to this passage here. This is the second time we see the word church used in the Bible. And just going back to the point I'm trying to make is, you know, when we talk about the church, we're specifically talking about the church that Jesus Christ is building. And I, I think we see this passage here as well uh, of what uh, the church is. It's a gathering together of people in the name of Jesus um, in Matthew 18. Let's look here in... Uh, Let's just read from verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And even he, he neglect to hear them. So you've gone one alone, you've gone with multiple witnesses to correct this brother. Now it says, tell it unto the church. So you bring it in a public Set, setting, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. So we see here the context now is dealing with conflict in a church situation. Now look at what it says here. Verily I say unto you. So is this singular or is this plural? This is plural now. Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall, uh, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So we see here these, this binding and this loosing that was said to Peter before is not really something that was exclusive to Peter because he says the same thing to the church, to, to, to believers. And you know, why does it say thee in Matthew 16? Well, probably because Jesus was talking to only Peter at that time um, and just talking to him as a person. But we see here that it wasn't something exclusively to Peter. Verse 19, again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two, and just note this, this is where I wanted to get to, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, 
There am I in the midst of them. So a church is a gathering together of believers. But it's not just any gathering together of believers. It's when they, I believe it's when they gather together um, for the purpose of Jesus Christ. Gathering together in the name of uh, Jesus Christ. And we see there it doesn't have to be many. It only has to be two is enough to make a church. Two or three, Jesus says. And he says, if you gather together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So we see there that Jesus Christ is the reason for the gathering and that's what makes a church a church and not just any sort of um, just any any, any um, uh, local gathering of people so jesus christ is the reason so that's what you know that's why we have bible reading that's why we have preaching that's why we have uh, songs singing about the word of god singing about jesus uh, we pray to god when we come together as a church and we fellowship uh, with the body of christ so what, the reason why I want to make that distinction there, because you know, church members just getting together and just hanging out, that isn't necessarily church because they're not gathering together for the purpose of Jesus Christ. So you know, if a couple of mates from church go and have a coffee together, is that church? Well, you know, it's a gathering of people, but it's not the church of Jesus Christ in the sense of gathering together in the name of Jesus. Um, and we just want to make that distinction because. Things like that matter because, you know, when we, when we talk about, you know, women preaching and teaching in church, which I believe is not right, you know, women should not preach and teach in church. But let's say, for example, a woman gets a class together, like a cooking class together, and, and you know, all those people in that gathering might be believers. But she's cooking, telling them, you know, how to cook a roast or something like that, and she's teaching them something, right? And even bringing in, you know, Bible, maybe Bible principles, is she teaching in the church? No, because I don't believe that gathering is church because they're not gathered for the purpose of Jesus Christ. They're gathered for the purpose of cooking. You know, so that setting is not necessarily wrong. And I'll, I'll, I guess I'll touch on that a bit more as I go into it in other weeks. But just that distinction in there of how we can determine what is a church and uh, what isn't a church. Now let's go to Ephesians 1, uh, 22 to 23. We'll see a couple of other verses here that show us that the church and we saw already in uh in in uh, chapter um i can't remember what, what we turn to but ephesians 1 uh, we will see here that the church is actually called the body of christ uh, look here in ephesians 1 verse 22 and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that Filleth all in all. Uh, let's go to Colossians 118. We'll see again where the church is called the body, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now remember when we talked about the body of Christ, there is one body, but there is not only one church. But because the church is made up of the body of Christ, it can rightly be called the body of Christ. So the church is the body of Christ, but whilst there is one body, there are multiple churches. Um, so there is one body, but can be multiple churches. So the church is like a physical subset of the body, isn't it? So you have the body of Christ, which is every believer, and then when some of those believers gather together, that is a church. Now why isn't why can there be multiple churches? Because there can be multiple gatherings, can't there, of the body of Christ? You can have a gathering here. There are probably other people gathering in houses and in buildings this morning, um, and, and there are separate churches. But we are all the body of Christ. But there isn't one church. There isn't one universal church, because are we gathered together with every believer? No, we're not. There are multiple gatherings. We're not gathered together with every believer. So there is not this concept of a universal church because until every believer is physically gathered together, there will not be uh, one single church. So how can we think of this? Well, you know, I have a body, right? I have a hand, right? And my hand can rightly be called my body, right? My hand is part of my body. So you can say the hand is Victor's body. But I have two hands, don't I? So it's the same with churches. We have a church 
which can be called the body of Christ. There's one body, but there can be multiple churches because a church is a gathering of members of that body. And you know, you only just have to search the word churches in the Bible and you'll find that it appears 37 times. So anyone that's trying to teach that there is only one true church as the Catholics and the Orthodox teach, they teach this concept of a universal church that we're all part of. They're mixing up the body and the church. And when you search the word churches in the Bible, I mean, it appears so many times, how can you possibly support the doctrine of the universal church when so many times you see churches in the Bible? Church here, a church there, the seven churches which are in Asia in Revelation. So there is not this uh, universal church. Now let's look at this verse in 1 Corinthians 11, 18. Now the word church in the Bible... Um, it, it's used in two ways. It, it doesn't only refer to the time when we're gathered here, but it also refers to the people that are part of this gathering. Because, you know, and this might get a bit complex, but, you know, it, there are two ways that the word church is used in the Bible. So the church doesn't only exist. The reason why I'm making this point is because the church doesn't only exist when we're gathered. And then we, when we disperse, the church no longer exists. The church exists whether we're gathered together or not. But the word is used to describe both. And I just want to show you that. Um, so in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 18, we see here, For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. 1 Corinthians 14, 19. So we see here that people are within this gathering, within this church. Look at what uh, um, Paul says here. Yet in the church, so he's saying in the physical gathering, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Um, but then let's look a bit further down. He says here in verse 23, If therefore the whole church be come together in one place and all speak with tongues, and they come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers. Will they not say, yeah, mad? So we see there almost two uses of the word church because he says, you know, when I, when I speak in the church, saying in the gathering, but then he also says when the church is gathered together into one place, if therefore the whole church be come together in one place. Now, if the church is only uh, the body when it's gathered together, how do you then gather that gathering together, if that makes sense? Am I, am I making sense? So we're not only the church when we're together, we're also the church when we're not together because we are, have been part of this gathering. So we see there that somebody can be in the church, but also the church can be gathered together. So it's, so it's not only the church exists when we're together because if you're already gathered together, how do you gather something that's already gathered together? Does that make sense? So we can see that, that the, the word church refers to the people that are part of that gathering, even though they may not be gathered together. Uh, look here in Acts 8. It says here, um, you know, as for Saul, verse 3, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. So Saul here, when he's persecuting the church, I mean, obviously the church is finding it hard to gather together and he's going into every house trying to find these Christians. So the church is scattered, even though they're still uh, the church. Um, and another thing here in Acts 14, I just want to show you. Acts 14, verse 27. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. So again, gathering the church together. So the church is not only the time when we're gathered together, it is the people of that gathering, even though they're not gathered together. Otherwise, how could you um, say that you're gathering the church together if it's only the church when they're gathered together? So how can you sum that up in one sentence? I know this is like a minor point, probably not important, but I'm just showing you here the church and how the word is used differently. So you can think of it this way. You know, we are in the church, but we also are the church. So it's both. And the, and the Bible uses the word in both ways, I believe. 
Now also in uh, Acts 14 here, we'll just read a couple more chapters. read from verse 19. I want to make this point that a church is not only a legitimate church if it has ordained leadership. So a church can, can exist as a legitimate church of God, a church of Christ, even if it doesn't have any elders, even if it doesn't have any bishops or deacons, it's still a church. And I think the reason why, you know, this is even a point and I just want to address it is because, you know, unfortunately power corrupts, right? And, you know, they say absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I think people that are in a position of authority, they, they tend to want to control people, right? And, 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 you know, if you're a bishop of a church, you may not want people just gathering together without a bishop. So you'll try and make a rule and say, well, that's not a real church and you need to be in a real church. And a real church is something that I'm in charge of. So this mentality comes across because people want to, you know, control people. They don't want the Spirit of God to, to, to work in the lives of people and they want to make man-made rules and man-made standards to sort of uh, change people's behavior. But I just want to show you this verse in Acts 14, well, this passage in Acts 14, that I think proves that a church can exist without any elders. Uh, let's read from verse 19. And there came there the certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to, to Derbe. So they're at Antioch and Iconium. They, they get stoned and then they go to another city. I, I'm just, the reason why I'm laughing as I re read this is because <laughs> you can imagine, I mean, it's probably very serious for them, you know, that Paul is dragged out of this city and he's stoned what I believe to death. And that's why he says later on in the epistle that he ascended up to the third heaven and, and, and saw things that you know, are not lawful to be uttered. So they're standing around him probably mourning, right? That he's like dead and probably disfigured from the stones. And then all of a sudden he just gets up. Uh, and it says here, uh, how we, as the disciples stood round about him. So they're probably standing around Saul mourning. All of a sudden he says he, he rose up and came into the city and the next day he departed with Barnabas to, to, to Derby. So it would have shocked them. Uh, the, but the reason why I'm laughing is because that scene just reminds me, if you guys you know, watch X-Men, it reminds me of Wolverine. Because you know Wolverine, he just gets pummeled and smashed up till he, he's just lying there dead. And because he has that regenerative power, he just regenerates and then all of a sudden he just starts breathing again and then comes to life. It, it makes me picture that in my head. So Paul just gets up, you know, he's brought back to life, I believe, by, by the Spirit of God. And then he, he rises up and he goes back into the city. The next day they depart the city and they go to Derby. So the reason why I just want to make that point there. So they're preaching in Antioch and in Iconium. Paul is stoned. They leave that city, right? They go to Derby and verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, Derby, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. So they preach the gospel in, in Iconium and Antioch and in Lystra. They leave to Derby, and then they come back again to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. And why do they want to come back? It says here, confirming the souls of the disciples. So the people that they had won to Christ previously, before they left to Derby, they're coming back to, to help them and ground them in the faith and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we through much tribulation, uh, that, that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And this is the verse I want to point out to you. Look here, it says, And when they had ordained them elders in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So he preaches the gospel in Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. They leave to Derby. They come back and confirm the souls of the disciples. And I believe the disciples were already gathering in churches. And then when they went to confirm the disciples, they were going to these churches. And then the Bible says in verse 23, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Now, how do you ordain an elder in a church if a church is not a church without an elder? So you see there that churches are legitimate. They can exist without elders, without bishops, without deacons. Otherwise, how could you ordain an elder in that church? Does that make sense? So this idea that you're not a legitimate church unless you have ordained leadership is not 
actually true. I mean, think about it. What about the scenario, you know, what if I, was, I were to die or I were to quit? Would, would this gathering here cease to be a legitimate church just because I quit or because I leave? No, right? You're, you're still a church. If, if a bishop dies or quits the ministry, that body of believers is still a legitimate church. They're, they're, they're not no longer a legitimate church as though Christ does not uh, you know, see them as, as a legitimate church. So this idea that you need to have qualified, ordained leaders, otherwise you're not legitimate, I believe is uh, not true. But does that mean that we don't seek to have uh, you know, ordained leadership and a church that has you know, qualified individuals to run that church? No, I mean, it's something that we ought to seek after. Let's look at this, uh, these verses in Hebrews 13. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. So they, those that have the rule over you, the leadership and the ruling uh, authority in the local church, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them, that have been occupied therein. So we see here a couple of reasons why we have people ruling in the house of God, ruling in the church of God, and why it's good to have rulers. And I mean, number one, for an example, right? Because it says, who have spoken unto you the word of the Lord, whose faith follows. So they're meant to be there to uh, be an example for you to follow. You can look at their lives. You can see the Bible says the end of their conversation and follow that. But not only that, the fact that they're speaking unto you the word of the word of the Lord, it says here, who have spoken unto you the word of God, you know, what will that result in? Well, in verse 9, we see here, be not carried about with diverse, this is different and varied, and strange, this is like, you know, weird or, or, not, or foreign doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. So the whole idea that it's good for a church to have leadership and qualified men teaching the word of God is so that we're not children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. That we're not just, you know, what do you, you know, when you're in a Bible study and there's, no, there's not anyone in that Bible study that's really studying the word of God that has the right positions, you know, they just go around this Bible study saying, oh, what do you think this passage means? And what do you think this passage means? And this is a bad way to learn the Bible because... You know, because you can be carried away, carried away and, and tossed about to and fro. You know, obviously we need to study the Bible and, um, you know, and study ourselves and get those positions. But if you have qualified leaders that are holding fast to the faithful word, it'll help you to be established and, and grounded in your faith so that you're not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Um, look at verse 17 here. It says, obey them that have the rule over you. So you know, this is something that's commanded by God. I don't think an elder should necessarily have to demand respect and demand obedience because God is commanding it. If you're right with God, you'll submit to the authorities that are in your life. And one of them in the local church is the elders and the bishops, which you know, is me. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Uh, pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. Um, <clears throat> so we see there that um, rulers are there to you know, rule the house of God. And you know, obviously I don't rule in your, your personal life. That has nothing to do with, with church. But I make decisions here and um, things that have to do with the church. I have authority. And why do I have authority? Well, the Bible says here, they watch for your souls because I'm, I'm responsible spiritually for, for your souls and for this church. And I have to give an account as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. So also we have rulers and authority in the church and in our lives because it is profitable to you. So I'll just go through a, a couple of things on my list. So, you know, it's an example for the church to follow. Uh, it prevents and exposes false doctrine. And, you know, this is why traditionally churches start with a bishop. 
know, because even though it's not a legitimate, it doesn't, oh, how am I renovating? Just because a church is legitimate without ordained leadership, it doesn't mean it's something that we want to seek. It just means if they're in that scenario, it, it doesn't like disqualify them from, you know, from being classed as a church, but it's not wise to have that scenario and it's not something we should seek. And that's why churches are traditionally started with a bishop to make sure that there is leadership there from the get-go. So it's wise to have uh, ordained leadership from the beginning and that's why we seek that. And you know, we should, as believers, I believe we should seek to be part of a church that has ordained leadership uh, in, in above seeking to be, a, be part of a church that does not have ordained leadership. Because when a church doesn't have ordained leadership, it's very open to uh, you know, disorder, you know, because there is no uh, you know, shepherd of that church, there's no pastor of that church, um, but also it's open to somebody's almost self-ordaining or self-appointing them as the leader of that church because that's what will inevitably happen is you know people are sheep and if one person just sort of stands up to be the leader he will inevitably be acting as that leader or as that self-appointed pastor even though they may not be qualified uh, or have not been ordained here's here's a, an illustration just to illustrate my point i mean let's say for example in a family the husband or the father dies or the husband or the father leaves that family or you know god forbid you know even a, a lady that you know uh, fornicates outside of marriage and, and now has a, a, is a is a single mom now are they not a family just because there isn't a father in that relationship no they're still a family but you know obviously that's not something we should be seeking you know we're not see the ideal scenario is that there is a mother and a father that are committed to one another um that 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 are the the, the bedrock of that that relationship, but it doesn't mean that if they are not in that ideal relationship, that they're not a legitimate family. Um, and you know, this is the reason why you know we don't seek to have separate fellowships, and we don't seek to separate off the children, because those groups then are not going to have ordained leadership in them. So why would we seek to try and create that environment? That's why we keep everyone together so that we have the safety of, um, uh, of ordained leadership overseeing things and knowing what is going on in this gathering. So we don't separate, that's why we don't have like separate youth groups that don't have, you know, bishops overseeing what's being taught and what's being discussed there. Uh, we don't have separate fellowship when we come together as a church. We, we learn together as a church and that's why we don't separate off the children. So really, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know, get, getting down to the semantics of it. You know, whether or not one, one group of people, whether they're determined as a church or not, is not really the issue because we really should be seeking for that ideal. We should be seeking for the ideal scenario, which is we have our ordained le leadership. So even if, even if we, we are happy to call a group that doesn't have leadership a church, it's, it's not ideal. Okay, so that's what a church is. So a church is a group of believers and it's a group of believers that have gathered for the purpose of Jesus Christ, gathered in the name of Christ, not just gathered for any purpose. That's what a church is. It's the people. So let's just cover a few things that a church is not then, obviously. So a church is not the building, right? Which is the most common way the word church is used. Like you'll drive down the road and people will say, oh, that's a nice church and that's a nice church. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, missionaries that travel, you know, go to foreign countries and they're meant to be in the church planting business, right? So they're meant to be gathering groups of people. But often what missionaries do, and I, you know, I personally believe, you know, a lot of it is money wasted. You know, they're going there and they're planting churches. And what they mean by that is they're going over there and they're spending hours and hours and, and hundreds and thousands of dollars of resources putting buildings up in this foreign country. And you just think... You just wonder that time that is spent building these buildings, the time that is spent gathering all those resources, trying to go around getting the support and getting the money just to build these buildings in other countries. I mean, that's not what their goal should be. Their goal is meant to be gathering people. So they're not planting churches when they're just building big buildings over in another country. Um, they may just be planting one church if they're building this building. But you know that should not be their goal to build all these buildings and spend all these resources and and time and money unnecessarily 
you know, I don't have a problem if a church needs a building, but oftentimes when I read these missionary letters, that seems to be the focus. You know, they go over there and, you know, they have this church um, and, and their main goal is to get this building up and running. <clears throat> so a church is not a building. You know, and church is not a single part of the gathering either. So church is not only the preaching. It's not only the singing uh, when we gather together. It's, it's the, the fact that we are gathered together here. Um, and the reason why I just want to make that point is even though we gather together in the name of Jesus and there is no preaching, that is still church. Because, you know, often people get this mentality, mentality that, you know, let's say a Wednesday night or a Friday night prayer meeting, that's like different to church. Like church is Sunday, and church is when we dress up, and church is when we, we, we have all these standards that we have for, for church on Sunday. But then when you go to the Wednesday night prayer meeting, all those standards, it's almost like it's revealing all the inconsistencies in people's standards. Because if you're going to wear a suit and a tie on Sunday morning, and you think that's how you should dress for church, well, why don't you dress like that on Wednesday night prayer meeting or Friday night prayer meeting or even if the church gets together to break bread together and just have singing maybe you don't even have prayer maybe you don't even have Bible reading but you're gathered in the purpose uh, for the purpose of Jesus Christ that's technically still church but nobody's going to be in a three-piece suit just getting together to break bread and have dinner so you know it's the whole time we're together and you know you know and I would definitely encourage you uh, to always be here for the whole time um, you know, often when, when I was in churches previously, you know, it just so happens, you know, me and Kevin were talking about this just best practice of having the songs first and then the preaching. Often what a lot of people will come, do is they will skip the first part and then they'll just make it there for the preaching. Um, so, you know, they know that there's about 15 minutes of songs and announcements and then they'll just come late and then they'll rock up just for the preaching because that's all they want to be a part of. And, you know, I'm not going to force anyone or condemn anyone for, for not... Uh, coming or you know ha having that mentality to not come I understand you know people you know maybe don't wake up on time or it's hard to get their uh, family together or whatever and, and don't come on time to church but I think if our heart is the heart of you know I don't want to be there for the singing I don't want to be there for the prayer but I want to be there for the preaching and almost lifting up one part of the church gathering over another I don't think that's right and I think you're just uh, you know you'd be missing out on blessings because you know, the, 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 all the parts of church are profitable for us. You know, the singing is profitable for us. The reading is profitable for you. The prayer is profitable and the preaching is profitable and the eating together is profitable. So I just think it's, uh, you know, you'll just miss out if, uh, if you're not there for the whole thing. Um, yeah, so it's not a single part of the gathering. It's um, the, ti the time we're together. What's another thing that church is not? Church is not uh, a religious ritual, which is what people uh, often think, especially from Catholics or Orthodox or people that are used to saying, you know, I go to church and it, it is this religious ritual that they go to and they tick it off on their spiritual checklist and they think, well, I've done this spiritual thing, therefore I'm more holy. You know, good works will never make you more holy. Church doesn't make you more holy. And church is not the, only the things that we're doing in this church so it's not uh, a religious ritual now you know good works don't make you more holy you know they'll make you more profitable to others as we lead, uh, uh, learn in James 2 it'll make you more obedient to God it'll give you a better relationship with God and it gives you a better relationship with others as well it'll give you more eternal rewards but it doesn't make you more holy or more separated that's what faith does and the blood of Jesus Christ all right, what's another thing that a church is not? A church is not a legal entity. So even if a group ha isn't registered as a corporation or isn't registered as an ABN, doesn't make them not a legitimate church. Um, you know, and that's why, you know, when, when we use the word church incorrectly, it's a good idea to correct your children, you know, correct people. Well, not necessarily correct people, you know, you don't want to just be correcting everybody. But I think definitely correcting your children. Like if your children use the word, words incorrectly, I think it's a good idea to correct them so that they have the right ideas with the words that they use. You know, Simon was reading this book and he was uh, looking at, uh, you know, these people walking into a church building. And he was saying, oh, look at the, the big church and the people. And I corrected him saying, no, no, that's, that's just a building. The people are the church. 
And, and I make it a point when my, my children use words incorrectly uh, to correct them. And, you know, we as believers should also use words correctly because if we use words incorrectly, we are just perpetuating sometimes a false idea. So a church is not a building. A church is not a, a single part of the gathering. A church is not a religious ritual. Um, it's not a legal entity. You know, therefore, a church is a legitimate church, even if it doesn't have any of these things. All right. Let me just try and uh, cover, cover, cover a couple of other things quickly. What about the question of when did the church begin? You know, and I guess it's, it's not really, this is not even really, I think, an important point. I just want to show you a couple of verses of when the church began because I, I guess it becomes a big point in dispensationalism and I'm not really, um, I am not dispensational at all. Um, I don't 100% understand every facet of dispensationalism, but I, I know that there, you know, a big part of it is, you know, they try and say that there's this church age. So if you believe that there's this church age, then you have to determine when that age starts. And this is when, when the church began uh, becomes a major issue. Uh, otherwise, I don't really think it's a major issue. But let me show you a couple of verses. Um, you know, because one situation, one position could be that the church started at the day of Pentecost. Because remember, we talked about being part of the body of Christ. You need to be saved and baptized into the body. And then the Holy Ghost started baptizing people at the day of Pentecost. So we see here, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with one accord in one place. And uh, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So that's one position. One position is the church started at the day of Pentecost. But you know, that doesn't make sense to me because if the church started at the day of Pentecost, how can we see here in Matthew 18, Jesus saying, and if he neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. And if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So how could the church of Jesus Christ start at the day of Pentecost if Jesus himself is saying before the day of Pentecost, if you have an issue and it needs to be escalated from one person to multiple people and then to the church, if the church doesn't exist, how do you escalate to this entity that doesn't even exist yet. So we see here that the church existed before the day of Pentecost. Uh, but not only that, in Acts uh, 7, we'll go to verse 38. <clears throat> Look at verse 37. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel. So now we're talking about the Old Testament nation of Israel. A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall ye hear. Look at this. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey. Um, just trying to make sure I get that verse I wanted to show you guys. Uh, I thrust him from them into Egypt. Ah, oh, just... Sorry, it's only the ones. Yeah. Oh, I can't remember where this is where this is the verse I want. But I wanted to show you there that the church is the the, 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 the congregation in the wilderness, as it's referred to in the in the Old Testament, the, the congregation of Israel is referred to as the church. I can't remember what passage I wanted to show to you, but you know how it says like you know they were all baptized unto Moses and passed into the sea, and they all did drink of that spiritual rock, and that rock was Christ. And we saw that passage before that we are baptized into one spirit and we've been made to drink of the spirit. And that's what adds us to the church. And these guys, they drank of that water physically, but maybe spiritually as well, they drank of that water, that spirit, and that's what made them a church. But they are referred to as a church. So did the church start at the day of Pentecost? Well, I don't think so because Jesus refers to the church in Matthew 18. In Acts 7, Stephen is preaching and referring to the congregation of Israel as the church in the wilderness. So, you know, when did the church start? Well, I just want to show you this verse here in Ephesians 3.20. 
Look at this verse. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. So this passage is saying that the church has always existed and Jesus Christ has been given glory in the church throughout all all ages not in just one specific age or time period so that would be my position my position is um, that the church has always existed because there has always been believers and they have always congregated and if they're a church of jesus christ the church has always existed that's why the congregation back in the old testament was called the church in the wilderness the church existed at the time of jesus but i guess the baptism of the holy ghost um, was um, uh, instituted at the day of Pentecost. So, you know, I don't know how to figure that. I haven't really thought that far, but, you know, maybe the, the, the body of Christ started at the day of Pentecost, but there was always the gathering of God's people. And now the church can rightly be called the body of Christ because the church is a gathering of God's people who are part of that body. So I believe the church of God has always existed. It didn't um, all of a sudden commence at one period. Now, the last thing I just want to cover quickly is how does a person then join a church? How does a person uh, be part of a church? And, you know, if you've been following along, obviously, with this sermon, you know, the, the answer is very simple. But let's just address a few things, a few misconceptions, I believe, about what we call church membership or joining a church. Because remember... A church is not a legal entity. It's not a members list that you're a part of because you can be on a members list but never be congregated or never assemble with that group of people. So a church is not in and of itself a members list. Now, why do churches keep a members list if that's not what makes you a member of the church? Well, generally, it's for you know financial or asset reasons. You know, the government... There are legal reasons if you want to register as a charity or register as a corporation that you need to keep a members list. So they need to you know, have this members list in order to determine who's part of their church to prove to the government that there is this group of people that are part of that church. So it could be for assets, you know, financial reasons, you know, sometimes because members can vote and members can determine how money is spent. They need to have this list because they don't just want anybody to be able to, to vote and to determine what they do with the finances. So assets or financial reasons, legal or tax reasons, or maybe they might have a members list for certification reasons, right? Maybe there's a school where you need to prove that your children are part of a church and you need this, uh, this certificate or this, this list to say, oh, here we are, we're on this list and therefore we're attending this church and we can be admitted to this school that has a requirement that you're a part of a church. So you don't join a church by being added to a list. You know, you can be part of a church even if you're not added on the list. And um, if you listen to the sermon about baptism, it causes issues there about, you know, who can be, who, who is part of the church and whether baptism adds you to a church, whether or not you can take part in communion and breaking of bread. So it's not a uh, members list. Um, and, you know, you're not added to a church by baptism with water. So we're, we're added to the church by the baptism of the Holy Ghost, not by the baptism of water. But where do people get the idea that you need to be baptized with water to be added to a church? Well, I believe they're mixing up these verses that talk about being baptized into Jesus Christ, being baptized into the body. And they mix up the fact that they're, even though the church can be rightly called the body, baptism with water doesn't add you to the body and therefore it doesn't add you to the church. It's baptism by the Holy Ghost. So they're mixing up not only baptism with the Holy Ghost and baptism with water, but they're also mixing up the church and the body. So, you know, water cannot add you to a spiritual body. I mean, neither can water add you to a physical body because you can be baptized and that's not going to get your, your, you know, your carcass here sitting in this room. So, you know, water, baptism with water doesn't add you to a physical congregation and it doesn't add you to a spiritual body and also, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't add you to a physical body because you can be saved and be part of the body but not be part of this physical gathering. And, you know, I won't turn to all the passages for sake of time, but if you look up the phrase added to the church or added to the Lord, 
I believe there is a difference in the Bible. There's a distinction between believers being added to the church, like in Acts 2, the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. And it says many believers were added to the Lord and that they should cleave unto the Lord. And that's a people joining an assembly and being baptized into Jesus Christ. So being baptized into Jesus Christ is when you're spiritually joining that body. But when you look up the phrase being added to the Lord, I think that's actually people joining a physical congregation. So what is, uh, so how do you join a church? Well, it's simply that you need to be saved and you need to be part of an assembly. Uh, that's that's, that's all, all it is. So somebody might ask, well, you know, you, obviously you have to be saved because you, you're not even saved. You're not even part of the spiritual body and the church is the body of Christ. So that's a no-brainer. Um, but then when we talk about physical presence, somebody might ask the question, well, how, well, then how physically present do you have to be until you're part of that church? Because let's say the church meets once a week, but you're only coming once a month. Are you then part of that church? Or let's say a church meets multiple times a week. A church might meet three times a week and you only go once a week. Are you then part of that church because you're not there every time they meet? And I'll answer that question this way. You know, maybe that question is of little importance because like when we talked about baptism with water, if you take away the perks of being part of a church, even giving you perks to something else, you know, for example, giving you perks to take part in communion, take part in the breaking of bread. If, if you don't have to be on that list or you just have to be there physically present when they do it, you can take part in it, then it doesn't matter how many times you go to church. Um, you're still part of that church because you've been part of that, that gathering at that time. Or let's say, for example, you take away voting. You know, I don't believe in, in voting. I don't believe in, in, in sheep you know, uh, choosing what to do. Because remember, we saw in Hebrews 13 that I have to give an account. So that's why, you know, I don't believe in voting because if I'm responsible and I have to give an account of how the finances are used, why would I then relinquish that authority to, to the authority of the majority when the majority is not going to be accountable for that? You know, and, and people might say, well, you know, does that, that leaves it open for people being corrupt and just using the money abusively or whatever. And you're right, it does open it up to that. But that's why that person is, is left in authority. They have to answer to God for how they do it. And to, to be frankly honest, like if, if, you know, if you guys don't trust how I use the money, then don't give to the church. You, know, you don't have to give to God this way. You can give to God another way. If you don't trust how I keep and I spend and I use the money, then it's better that you give it somewhere else in good conscience. Uh, so you know, I'm fine with people not giving money if they don't trust how it's being used, but I'm not going to then put that trust over to the majority of a church and then let's say, okay, we're all going to decide by majority vote how this money is used because generally the majority can be wrong. I mean, we're still a small group and we know each other quite well. It's probably not going to happen if we had a vote now. But this is why, you know, large churches should not be doing things by voting or majority vote. <clears throat> and, you know, you know, if a school, you know, if you had to enroll in a school, I can understand why they would need to have a church membership but if you remove that fact, if somebody could join a school without having to prove that, then how often you go to a church would be irrelevant. And it's the same uh, with legal documentation. So how many times do you have to go to a church to be part of a church? I mean, does, I mean maybe that question doesn't even need an answer because if you take away all the perks, it, it doesn't really matter. You should just be there as often as you can. And if you're there enough times for the church to recognize that you're part of the church, maybe that makes you part of the church. But maybe it doesn't really matter. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, that's, how, that's what I believe about that. So I don't know whether there's really an answer to that question, how many times you need to go to a church to be part of it. So I hope you learned there today the difference between church and the body, um, you know, how to join a church, what a church is. Um, and we'll continue over the next couple of weeks, a couple of more issues about church and um, you know, learning about church authority and what is the purpose of church.